Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here at The Real Science Exchange. And we have a few things uh, to celebrate tonight. First, this is our 50th episode. We started Real Science Exchange as an extension of our Real Science Lecture series of webinars, and we're so pleased to have developed such a consistent and growing audience. Jeff is our co-host today. Uh, Jeff's part of our technical service team and was uh, part of an extensive podcast taping session that we did during the ADSA this year. Uh, So welcome back, Jeff. It's always good to have you as a co-host. All right. Appreciate it. The second thing about this episode is we're bringing back one of my favorite segments. It's called the Legacy Series. Here we commemorate the pioneers of the industry taking a look back at their careers and the impacts and their lives. And tonight we have the honor of celebrating the career and contributions of Dr. Mike Hutchins from the University of Illinois. Mike's no stranger to the Real Science Exchange and it's actually uh, credited and he's actually credited with coining the term pubcast. Do you remember doing that, Mike? I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, so when was that? I, I forget which one it was. Um, he had done a he'd done a webinar, and then we had I forget who was on there with you, Mike. But you uh, said I think you need to start calling this a pubcast. <laughs> that stuck. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So yeah. So I you know Mike, I really appreciate you uh, agreeing to come here and allowing us to uh, roast your I mean toast your career. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mike, uh, it, it's a tri- tradition uh, to ask everybody what's in your uh, glass tonight. So are you drinking anything special for tonight's uh, uh, 50th anniversary podcast? You bet. I got my royal crown right here in my glass here. Excellent. You know, I see also that you brought a couple guests with you. Um, Dave Fisher from the University of Illinois and Dr. John uh, Geeser from um, Rock River Lab. Gentlemen, please tell us what you're drinking tonight. Well, I uh, decided to bring out the Maker's Mark with a splash of Coke, maybe more more than a splash. But uh, Maker's Mark is my uh, preferred drink. And now, years ago when I was younger and no money, beer was kind of on the table. But now Maker's Mark is the spot. Yeah. I like bourbon myself. Yeah. And John, what, what's in your glass tonight? Being a, being a warmer time of the year as we record this, I, I tend to side with uh, west coast ipa so it used to be called todd the axe man but now it's just shortened up for axe man uh, i hate to admit i'm, I'm drinking a, a beer from minnesota but <laughs> whatever whatever wet your whistle standing yeah. um, you know, despite all the great microbrews in wisconsin i have to cross the border into the gopher state yeah good job and jeffrey what are you drinking tonight well like several of you on here i've always chose bourbon but a lot of times in the summer, I switch, and I'm actually drinking a really good Puerto Rican rum that I brought back from a vacation I had back in May. So drinking some rum tonight. All right. Nice. Well, for me, um, I usually have a bourbon, but tonight in honor of uh, Dr. Hutchins, I'm having a, a Baijo. And so if you're not f- familiar with Baijo, that is a it's a Chinese drink. I'm not sure what it's made of, but I'm sure rocket fuel's involved somewhere. Uh, there's a reason that it's still around, Mike. I I got this. Mike and I uh, went on a trip to China and I bought this uh, on on the way out and brought it home. And there's a reason it's still around because I'm not I'm not a fan. So (laughs) yeah, the other thing you need to know is that um, the length of these podcasts are often determined by how quickly my drink goes. So (laughs) this one may not we may have a very long podcast tonight. So we're in for a marathon I hear. Yeah, exactly. So Tonight's PubCast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk, reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. Visit balchem.com to learn more. Uh, you know, Dr. Hutchins is a dedicated ag educator. He won the title of ex- uh, Extensionist of the Year outstanding teacher in the United States, most influential influential person in the American dairy industry, and he also received the ADSA Honor Award. So, Mike, can you kind of give us some background of how it all started? Give us a, a little taste of your early years. 
Well, it's uh, a, a pleasure to, to join the group here tonight, and it's fairly humbling, to be very honest with you. Uh, we started out in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, a small dairy farm with 70 cows with my dad and my sister and my mother and my grandparents there. And uh, that was a big farm back in those days. And I remember we would celebrate when uh, ice cream, we, we had a big, big celebration. We'd go and get ice cream. And so when we got our first 10,000 pound herd average, that was an ice cream night. Wow. And about two months later, one cow hit 100 pounds of milk on DHI. And that was another ice cream night. So anyway, that's the dairy background. And actually, uh, uh, growing up, I was active in 4-H and FFA, and they really impacted kind of where I thought I was going to go in my career. When I went to the University of Wisconsin, I was majoring in ag uh, education and extension, and uh, then had to get a job. And I thought, well, I'd, uh, there was an opening in the dairy science lab in the basement to counting white blood cells. That's a little bit better than hoeing soybeans. Not much, but a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Counting white blood cells on a, a, a slide there for three or four hours at a time. Uh, that, that'll, that'll make you think about what your career choices are going to be. But anyway, I got a chance to meet up with some very good graduate students. Uh, at that time, Dr. Don Wiesman, somebody would recognize that name, was in that lab there. And Russ Renzig was in that lab. Steve Larson was in that lab also at, from Horst Dairyman. And I said, you know, that's a pretty good gig. And so I, I switched majors and uh, then I majored in, in dairy science, got in, getting my degree in uh, first degree in 1965 at Wisconsin. I uh, was fortunate enough to get one of the Perina fellowships and stayed at Wisconsin for a master's in mastitis detection and a PhD in ruminant nutritionist uh, nutrition. And that was under the leadership of Dr. L.H. Schultz. And he's always known as Dr. Schultz to me. He earned that respect. He was a professor's professor and always wore a tie every day to the office. And uh, every time we had an experiment, we're bleeding cows, he would come down to the barn in his tie, in his coveralls, and he would bleed cows with us, make sure nothing went wrong or something was happening with one of the cows as well. Also got to meet Dr. Jim Crowley. Some of you older people will recognize that name, a very famous extension worker in Wisconsin. And then my uh, college coach was uh, Dave Dixon. And some of you will recognize that name as well because uh, he was a real icon in the in the youth judging uh, coaching career as far as that goes. And then after graduating from the University of Wisconsin, I went up to Minnesota, fortunate to get a job there and spent eight years there as an extension dairy specialist. And due to an untimely death up there, I was uh, I was given the chance to coach a judging team. Uh, I was the only one that ever judged cattle in that staff there. So uh, being the new kid on the block, I got the chance to be the college coach up there for about five years. And we were lucky to win the year I left to come to Illinois. We won the national championship there, which I thought was our third best team. Very nice. They, they, they hit her. They hit her as far as that goes. Another mentor up there uh, would have been uh, Dr. Don Otterby, who has passed away. Uh, you know, it's amazing coming out of grad school, John, you might be able to relate to this as well, that uh, nobody wants to know about the TCA cycle. <laughs> they, they want to know why their cows would eat this feed as far as that goes. So there's many hours spent with Dr. Don Otterby uh, trying to get answers to say, how am I going to answer this question as well? So, John, I don't know if you concur with that or not, but uh, uh, certainly that can uh, can be important. Absolutely. Come, comes up weekly in conversations. Yeah. Uh, then in 79, I, I left uh, Minnesota uh, and went to the University of Illinois and actually I met Dave Fish for the first time at a, a DHI regional meeting. And I said, who is this young kid? You know, wow, we, he's, he's <laughs> off with them bigger and vitality, you know, and, he, and was one of the reasons we came to Illinois. And there was other reasons as well, but certainly this, this was, was one of them out there as well. And so we've had 32 wonderful years here at the University of Illinois, uh, sprinkled in there with six years in the Army Reserve uh, back uh, in when I was in the graduate school at Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, we did that. And, uh, and AGR, Alpha Gamma Rho, was a fraternity that was very influential in my life then and still is we still have lifelong friends and and I, I guess little that i know by joining that organization of the impact that could have in my career uh, i've met my wife there uh at a beer supper we'll just leave that alone for now we can go on that later <laughs> uh, and uh was on the judging team so scott maybe that gives you a quick view of kind of where i came from how i got in dairy where i've been and uh, when i'm probably longer than i should have no, that's fine. L let me circle back, though, a little bit on your kind of the early years. Um, what was the dairy industry like back then? And, uh, you know, do you have any any stories related to that? 
Well, well cer certainly uh, our, our dairy farm, 70 cows, that was a big farm. In fact, we had a hired man there as well. And so that was... Uh, what would you say was average for most? So you guys are around uh, 70? I'm guessing maybe around 25 to 30. I mean, okay. everybody has pigs. Everybody had chickens on the farm. We raised sugar beets as a side crop there. And, and so it was a very diversified farm, even though we had, uh, we had, we had 70 cows. And of course, like everybody else, we expanded, added six more here and eight more there and changed the layout of the barn just a little bit. And then at Minnesota, you know, amazing extension work day. When we were at Minnesota, we would end up uh, we had uh, Stearns County, which at that time was in the top 10 in the United States. And the county had so many farms that when we had an extension meeting, there was four of them, four in each of the co uh, corners of the county, because each of them would draw about 100 to 150 dairy farmers there. And at that time, extension was kind of it. Uh, I don't know, Dave, if you want to agree with that, but l literally uh, extension was, in fact, some of the farmers wouldn't make a move unless the county agent said, yes, Joe, I think that is what you should do as far as that goes. Dave, your comments? Uh, you're no, that same era. Right. Ab absolutely. I mean, you know, back then uh, uh, we were the we were the consultants. And uh, even though we tried to take the research and condense it to the uh, efforts to uh, share it with the producers themselves, uh, give them new ideas and help them through some of the troubling times. Uh, but if there was a decision to be made, they would they would come to us. And uh, uh, I know they've uh, always would come to Dr. Mike. Now they'll come to me second. I was always the second guy on the string there. You know, Mike wasn't in the office. Well, I guess I'll call Fisher. Maybe he can he can help me out too. That, that right. mean even type relationship is what I'm hearing here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're hearing. <laughs> It's interesting, Scott, uh, maybe some of the listeners that have got a little more vintage of my age there, uh, a high moisture ear corn and shell corn was a huge controversy. And uh, Dr. Howard uh, up at the Marshfield Experiment Station was doing some classic work on comparing those two feeds. Uh, a, a chain a chain feeders, a cow wear the chain and it would turn on the grain feeder automatically. And she could stand there all day if she wanted to eat grain, but that was a big breakthrough to get more grain into cows when you weren't in stanchion barns as far as that goes. And the other one that perhaps it, it found interesting was we call cafeteria mineral feeders. And, and back in those days, uh, they put this feeder out in the cow yard and there'd be maybe 12 to 14 boxes. And the cow then would go out and decide, is today, should I eat zinc? And tomorrow, should I eat salt? And the next day, should I eat bentonite, you know? And uh, that was a really hot topic. And so we did some research at our experiment station uh, over two years to see what did cows actually do when exposed to these boxes and tracked it every day, as far as that goes. So uh, none of that technology is here today, but uh, <laughs> it's a dynamic that kind of dates what's going, what's going on. Well, I'm curious what the results were. I, I'm going to take it that certain cows had uh, proclivity for different minerals and they, they weren't really good at balancing their own rations. Well, that was it. The, the ration was all balanced. Uh, now, Jay might uh, argue and John with me that we balanced the rations to meet all the cows' requirements. So it was all known as luxury consumption. And they could always find sodium bentonite and we moved it around and they'd find salt. And those are the two that they would tend to uh, seek out and find and consume. And uh, and they would eat probably, you know, a, a tenth of a pound of bicarb. Yes, there was bicarb in the ration. And they'd eat maybe a quarter pound of bentonite. And uh, they were on no dirt. So obviously uh, that became a, a pretty nice uh, substitute for maybe consuming uh, clay mineral. Yeah. Dave, I found it interesting that you said you guys were the, the nutritionists back then um, for the dairy farmers. How many... Or w what size of a territory did you have, and uh, how many farmers would you theoretically consult for? Well, basically, when I started with Extension in 1971, um, I started as a county advisor, county Extension advisor, county farm advisor, whatever. And uh, I uh, was always gunning for a dairy position, but at that time, uh, the county person had to do everything, you know, everything from uh, tomato hornworms to uh, uh, balancing ration for dairy cows, whatever. But so I, I enjoyed uh, working in two or three different counties. I did get to the county, Clinton County, Illinois, which was again like Mike talked about Stearns up at the Stearns County from Minnesota. Clinton County, Illinois was a very strong dairy county. So I went in there as a county advisor, which allowed me to work with. We had over 350 farm, dairy farms in Clinton County back in 1980. Now there's probably about uh, 45 dairy, or maybe maybe more than that, maybe about, about 60 dairy farms or so. But bottom line, 
Uh, I then, back in about 1990, took over statewide responsibility as a dairy educator. So from 71 to about 90, the first, first 18, 20 years, I worked pretty much as a county with a regional dairy emphasis, regional being about seven, 10 county area. And then back in uh, 92, we restructured in Illinois. And that's when I got a chance to work full speed ahead on, on the state. And one of the reasons, uh, go ahead, John. I'm sorry. One of the reasons I could do that because I had this good friend, uh, colleague, co-worker, Dr. Mike, who allowed me to do that. Is interesting. Some of my colleagues in agronomy, uh, they're state specialists up on campus. We're not real happy that these county people would want to come over and take responsibility. Where well, Dr. Mike says, hey, Fish, come on, let's do it. So that was a good, a good plus for me to have work with Mike. And I guess what I'd add, Scott and John, is, is that showed that how extension was changing then. And that was really a change for the better. Uh, we ended up having two dairy specialists, I think three or four swine, a couple in beef. Uh, and, and, that, and, and and so it, it, the extension leadership said, we, we think we need to get more expertise out in the regional areas. And that, that worked well. And of course, boy, it just keeps changing again. We can talk about that a bit later if we wish. Yep. So a question on that, and Dave, I heard you refer to it as educator. Yeah. So do you find that synonymous with extension or was it a different role? Oh, I think I find that synonymous with extension. You know, again, um, uh, we were we were challenged to be able to stay abreast as best we could on, on our specialty area. And that's what I really enjoyed back when we were able to specialize in a certain area. I just did dairy after 1992. And so, uh, yeah, and so my role was that of educator, you know, put on programs, uh, uh, not as much on farm consulting, even though we still did it. But then we had people like John, who was a specialist in his role, and, and they were coming on the scene now. We're getting more and more consultant in the feed industry like yourself, Jeff, et cetera, et cetera. So, but yes, educator would be what I synonymous with extension. Okay. And, and you know, Jeff, we we called them advisors. And so, Dave, you were an advisor at one time, yeah, exactly. and then he became an educator. We did not have county agents. Now, those uh, crooks in Wisconsin, they had county agents, and so did we <laughs> have them in Minnesota, county right. agents. But uh, we are always known as advisors here, and right. so right. they transitioned to the word educator. And I think, Dave, that that kind of gave you the the one up, like, well, it's a step up from the uh, right. being the, the advisor. He's a county advisor. That's right, right. And I was really very pleased that I could work with. Mike had mentioned a number of people there from from Minnesota staff and and Illinois staff. But Jeff, you you were there in Illinois. You know the the Jimmy Clark's and the Jim Drakeleys and all those good guys that I was able to work with. Uh, in addition with with Mike and 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 uh, uh, also uh, you know Dick Wallace and other people like that. But I really think that uh, extension has made another change since uh, Mike and I retired back in 2010. Uh, be that right or wrong, it happened. Uh, they moved away from uh, being more in the production agriculture and more in the general again. Yeah. Enough, enough said on that one. So what, what, what caused that change? Um, it good, good question, Scott. Good question. I'm not, I think maybe, uh, trying to be everything to everybody, uh, got a lot into the uh, uh, master gardener um, areas and, and um, a lot more in the general clientele. There have been differences in, in funding from a, from a USDA, from a federal standpoint as well that have contributed? I, I don't remember for sure. I know we were, you know, certainly funded, you know, through uh, federal, state and local and I'm not sure, John, that that's exactly what started it. I think just the idea of someone's uh, per dime change, man, and everybody everybody makes changes. But yeah, and and let's let's pick on Balcam uh, as an example. You have some tremendous uh, uh, people in your staff there that provide support to the dairy industry. And, and so some of the administrators said, well, you dairymen, you've got other sources you can go with. And also, by the way, you've got the wherewithal. You can buy that, you know. So we're going to go to uh, uh, more of an urban flavor, more of a small dairy farm, the more 
uh, that direction as well. So in some respects, uh, the, 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 the support industries came into bat here. And I, I, I smile because uh, perhaps the one that capped it really off was RBST. Uh, they had tremendous horsepower in terms of personnel, more so than most land grant colleges even could dream about doing at this point. And they were going to the farms. In fact, in Illinois, uh, we had a, a gentleman hired that would deal with farms under 500 cows, and then the, these other ones would come in with herds over 500 cows, and so they were very specialized. And then I, I guess I'd add to that, Dave and John, uh, the, the the clientele also have high expectations. Uh, they're not going to come to a dairy meeting just to eat a donut and, and have a lunch. Uh, they want specific answers that's going to fit to their farms. And in that case, if you go to their farm and you spend a half a day on that farm, be it with a uh, ball cam or be it with some other firm that you can really make some some uh, headway in terms of maybe helping uh, solve maybe some challenges or uh, find some new opportunities. Mike, I think you hit on, on, on one aspect of, of, of the changing over the last, that we've seen over the last few decades with, with regards to extent, extension, certainly the specialization. So Dave, as you were talking about before, the wide breadth of knowledge that you needed to carry from your extension right. and educator support role and where we are now today, we are very specialized. And so from, from my perspective, uh, as an adjunct, uh, as a professor with the University of Wisconsin, but then working in the Rockford Laboratory world and uh, also offer some private consulting, when I, when I sit next to somebody on a plane and describe what I do, it's it's not that I'm in the dairy industry, it's not that I'm an agriculture, it's I'm a dietitian for animals. And even within that, I yeah. focus on a very specific segment of animals and in, in ruminants and dairy cattle and then carbohydrates are, are really my forte so i, I think uh where, where we've transitioned to the industry providing uh more support certainly than we were 15 20 years ago it, it comes with that specialization and, and desire to to offer expertise in, in more specialized areas like i'm going to come back and, and toss some praise your direction though this is something i really admired uh it, it, that, that i've experienced uh for, from uh, and, and seen you get done over the last decade to two is staying current and staying uh, kind of on the cutting edge of, of, of uh, if you will, of science and not necessarily just in the carbohydrate area, like I spoke to before, but looking at protein and amino acids, uh, other nutritional solutions uh, and, and strategies in the diets, as well as carbohydrates. And you've done an exceptional job. I think back to just a couple of weeks ago at a meeting where uh, Dr. Dave Combs, one of my mentors uh, and I were, were up speaking and Who's in the front row taking notes on us, keeping us to task? But my conscience, <laughs> diligently writing it, and I, I just I, I want to maybe pose a question to you, Mike, as well. How do you how do you continue to find the motivation? How do you continue to 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 lead us? Where, where does this come from? Well, I, I think that's one of the real challenges. And John, uh, for our listeners, uh, that's one reason we have John on the link here because I think you're kind of the future. Kind of where where this uh, where the uh, uh, leadership and education is going to come from, and of course, Volcam is on here with Jeff. Uh, same same the same story that basically uh, you, you people are going to be providing more of the I call the education leadership here. Uh, because obviously your 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 companies have said this is important to our business as far as that goes, and I think David, that's a little bit of a problem we had. Our our business was strictly education, and so uh, we had to earn our money. In other words, we had to put on clinics and that try to earn some travel money as far as that goes yeah. as well. So uh, John, I, I think it's it, that's why you're here today, and and uh, and, and so to answer your question, that that's always a challenge. I, I guess I always enjoy reading. Uh, progressive and hordes dairyman and i know your authors in both of those magazines and and the other ones as well kind of seeing oh, oh, who who's writing on what topic and kind of what angle they're taking and and i, I was talking with scott uh, a bit earlier i said you know right now everything is feed costs and the question is how many times can we write about feed costs to make it look like a a, a fresh topic and, and make it really uh, look new or or exciting to read or or a new concept or idea. And, and that's why I'm pretty jealous of you, John, because you've got this great big testing lab behind you there, which is all this data, you know, that, um, you know, I, I was critical of some of my nutritionists here at Illinois and at Minnesota that they would have all this feed information and yet they were just going to look at an amino acid. And yet they had dry matter intakes, they had body condition scores, they had feed particle size, and that never saw the light of day. And yet you've got the ability to pool that data and actually make it uh, make it work uh, and and uh, as a source of information. So, uh, John, that's a real challenge. How do you keep getting fresh ideas on topics when you do not have a research group or lab 
or in your case, a testing lab to, to draw information from? Good well, question. It's, it's, it's one of the reasons that I remain committed to the, the Rockefeller Laboratory family. And uh, I, I didn't necessarily understand the opportunity that, that would be in front of us and in front of myself uh, when, when beginning work about a decade ago with the laboratory. But you're right, Mike. I mean, we're on the cutting edge. And at some level, I would consider myself an extension extension agent on steroids, if you will, because of what we have in, yeah. in data and what we're seeing in trends and the questions we get from the field as well. We tend to be on the front edge. Yeah, and and it's it's, it's pretty interesting because there's probably two or three or four times a year I reach out to John, asking him for any data that he might have on for its quality or a unique feedstuff or an experience that they would have out there in the program. So, so certainly uh, you become a resource. And I guess if there's anything I would go, another reason why Dave is on today, and that is a team effort. And so when Dave came on as an educator uh, here. Oh, he took over an area, an area that we, we couldn't cover that included youth activities, that included uh, a forage production, that we had no skill set there because the crop science people said we're going to go corn and soybean. So they retired their, 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 their forage specialists and this forage, forage researcher out there in the program. So Dave took that over there. And then he also developed some skill set in manure and housing and certainly big topics, big topics as far as that goes. Because again, our engineers uh, that we had, uh, he retired and they didn't replace him either. So uh, Dave filled in some some really neat things on our team, and that's how we saw it as a as a team. We had to go with along with Dick Wallace. So so Dave was actually the manure expert, Mike. It wasn't yourself. I've, we, we've talked a lot about people starch over the past few decades. And Good point. I, yeah. Manure expert, but it, it's actually Dave is what I'm hearing. Well, you're right though, John. Mike would talk about uh, that uh, pie, the pumpkin pie uh, manure pile, and Mike would talk about a lot of the manure stuff. And sometimes he got a little nickname of. He really knows his manure, you know. And uh, <laughs> but yeah, and, and Mike sounds Mike, like a t shirt to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. But Mike was right. We had so much fun because Mike had his special areas, and I was allowed to develop in mine. And and then Dick Wallace added to it. And and then also, we had good people on campus. We still had the Department of Dairy Science yet when this was kind of going on. And and Jeff, you remember this young man named Reg Gomez who was a department head there. Well, Karina even worked with Rich, I think, but right. But um, yes, so, yes. yeah, yeah. So we had, we had a lot of support uh, and allowed Mike and I and Dick Walsh to do these things. But yeah, so that was the fun part. We were talking earlier about uh, changes and what maybe uh, caused the changes um, in the extension and the need for extension. How much of it had to do with the changing needs of the dairy farmer? They've obviously gotten larger uh, in the time span that 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 you've been uh, in extension, Mike. Uh, different uh, geographies have have gotten larger, other smaller. W what role did that play in in the need and then the role that extension played in that? Well, I'll, I'll kick it off and simply saying that, uh, as I may have inkled a bit earlier, that uh, uh, farmers, uh, uh, most of the, the general meetings would cover a wide swath, swath of information. And, and yet that farmer wants a very specific answer. Why are my cows lame? Uh, why is my butterfat test uh, low or high, whatever the case is going to be? So I, I think they're becoming uh, much more targeted in terms of the information they want. Very knowledgeable. They listen, they read the same articles I read. Uh, some of them are read the same journal of dairy science that I read as well. And so very sophisticated. So they're, they're very knowledgeable at this stage of the game and uh, basically are, are keen that they want to have the, the right answers. And if you look at the PDPW, for example, very targeted programs. Uh, it used to be they'd always have a feeding school. Well, now it's, you know, it's going to be a, a lameness school or it's going to be one on economics and, and, and bookmarking and stuff like that. So I, I think the clientele has forced some of that, you know, and a lot of that is one on one. And uh, David, I would suggest that was not seen as a real a real plus for you. And you went up right. for a promotion or tenure. You didn't say how many farm visits you made a year. The question was, how many articles did you write? Or how much money did you bring in? For example, those were kind of the benchmarks. And uh, that might be a little bit different than if you were working for a Lanco or, or Ballcam or something like that. Seems to me like the, the need for education is is expanding exponentially with technology and, and the things that we're currently learning about uh, uh, nutritional needs of animals. Are we meeting the, the producer's needs today? And if not, 
um, what do we need to do to meet those uh, that information transfer? Well, I'm a little biased here, and I'll let the Dave jump in here as well because he was one of my instructors as well. But we elected in uh, 1999 to go online with classes. So if you could get to the internet then you could take our classes as far as that goes. And those were college uh, certified classes by the graduate school. So if you were a, getting a degree at the University of Illinois or at Iowa State or Texas A&M, we had about 14 universities that would send students to us to take our class as an elective. And they would take a final exam, they get grades, but they would, they would actually go to class. But about a third of those people in that class were dairy farmers farmers who wanted to know more specifically about feeding and nutrition. And some had huge successes with it. We had one dairyman who wrote after the third period, class period, he said, I got my money out already. The changes we did, I got my money back already. So I'm going to start making money on you guys now. And of course, our, our trick was we wanted 10% of the profits, Dave and I, but that never seemed to, the check never right. seemed to get to us in the, in the mail as far as that goes. Right. So certainly, I, I think that uh, that was certainly a, a new way of delivery. Then, of course, here comes COVID, and that really shuts down all the meetings. In fact, there was two years I had no face-to-face -face meetings. John, maybe you had some, but I I didn't have any. I didn't have any as far as that goes. And, and so now the question is, how you how did you deliver? And, and of course, we then have something we call Zoom or go to webinar or. Uh, uh, stream uh, the, the platform around today, you know, StreamYard, certainly that becomes another way of delivering information. And uh, they said, well, farmers will never do that. Well, just go to PDPW and see what they've done with their online classes. Look what you've done, Scott, here with Balkan, the number of people that come to your programs uh, that are either live or probably even more so when they're recorded because, you know, uh, they can't be here at two o'clock in the afternoon. They, they're, they're, they're doing something else. But, you know, at eight o'clock at night, they can go to the website, download it and listen, listen to the presentation. So certainly th those are going to be very futuristic things. And, and of course, uh, uh, our class then got picked up by um, the Santa Fe Institute. And so now it is now available in English, Portuguese, uh, just completed here this uh, last month in Spanish. And it's going to be, believe it or not, tra translated into Iranian. Uh, and so it's going to be available in those languages there. And of course, you can guess what the next language they would like to do. And it's called Chinese. But they don't have the tie to it yet uh, to be able to deliver the package as far as that goes. So I, I, I think this distance learning online and um, Basically, for those of you that aren't aware of it, uh, we made a commitment that once a week, I mean, once a month, we will go live and it's fair game. Any questions you want to raise, we will try to answer. And it's just amazing uh, the, the level of questions. Some are very high tech to the point that I got to get back to you next month. Be sure you come back. We'll have an answer for you. Or some that are very straightforward that farmers would have asked uh, 10 years ago, as far as that goes, because we're, we're going to the Middle East countries. We're going to uh, China. We're, again, not a very sophisticated industry at this point. So certainly, uh, John, you may want to, and Dave, you may want to jump in here and, and add to or subtract from that. What I'd speak to is, and Scott, you posed the question, have, have we met the needs of, of the, the dairy industry? And, and I, I would say no, because that's that's an insatiable uh, thirst, if you will. The, the, the needs, the demands, the, the quest for continued education, continued knowledge transfer, uh, it's never ending. It, as Dave, uh, we have, it, and Mike, you and I have, have done work domestically and abroad. And there are certainly differences between uh, United States and, and domestic uh education and, and then abroad, uh, for example, working in South America, it, it, it's going to be at a different tier, perhaps a, a little bit more rudimentary abroad relative to the United States, or there may be a, a, a bit further, a bit more broad of a, a knowledge base, but it, it's, it's, we'll never, we'll never meet the needs per se. We'll, we'll, we'll never answer all the questions uh, to be answered. And I think what Mike speaks to is the desire to uh, learn more and and to use different uh, communication channels. It's been amazing how that's evolved and, and how we've adapted and evolved as an industry. Uh, Dave, your your thoughts? No, I'm I'm picking up exactly what you guys are saying. And uh, you know, I think also over the last 10, 15 years, 
uh, even in the conferences that, that I was involved with, with the four state you know, four state conferences, and uh, we have had a large turnout of uh, of audience of, of uh, participants, but probably about ninety percent of them were the consultants. And so again, Mike indicated that the producers are out there trying to pick up as much as they can. But I think we also see because everyone has such a full plate that they are allowing or asking their especially their 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 consultants to to go get the information and bring it back to us. And again, that's a little bit different from what we used to know when Mike, Mike and I would do 10 to 12 dairy days a year, uh, do some night meetings with that, do some farm visits with that, all the one on one. Um, and we just weren't doing that anymore because, again, everyone's producers plates were so full. Uh, people like John came in and started networking with other other industry people and were able to fill the gap as an educator as well, along with Jeff and others. You know, we've been talking about how technology is going to help uh, knowledge transfer to humans, right? And and I can't help but wonder, uh, are we going to go too far? Uh, do we, Are we going to need to educate humans if we have, right? We've got artificial intelligence, machine learning, sensors. We're able to sense all kinds of biology and understand it. Is it going to come a day when we have a machine like Watson on every farm that's making the decision and spitting uh, out the, the report to your your phone that tells you what to do. You don't need to know anything. Uh, and that's, let, let, let me jump in on that because I'm, I'm tied in with a, a few different groups from, from a networking perspective, but we're getting into that. If I would retrace my steps, and I, I certainly don't know the first thing about artificial intelligence and machine learning, but I'm, but I'm, I'm learning, uh, no pun intended, a, alongside some of my colleagues that are far more skilled in that area. And uh, Scott, my vision is that there will always need to be a human intelligence component. Uh, I believe that the in the next five to 10 years, and, and certainly in my career, there will be an evolution to what consulting, advising, and education looks like. There, there will likely be less individuals of, of Dr. Hutchins, of Dr. Fisher's caliber, but those that uh, are of, of, of this caliber will, will be in positions to help steer rather than perhaps be on farm every couple of weeks or, or, or once a month. So there will be novel and innovative decision-making tools uh, tools and products that aid in decision making, but there will always be, in my vision, a need for that human intelligence component. And part of it is rooted in, do we have even 50% of dairy nutrition in this dairy cow figured out? I would argue no. There's so much that, that we don't have any idea of, of what's happening within the rumen uh, from a, a biochemistry and biology and microbiology standpoint. Uh, so th th those are some of my thoughts being in the mix with, with some of these developing technologies at the moment. You know, kind of a follow up to that, John, is I'm, I'm kind of wondering um, if you were advising students today going into college, what kind of classes uh, would you advise them or what kind of curriculum or, or even advising, uh, you know, universities? What kind of curriculum should we be designing for the, 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 the next generation of uh, dairymen? Core Scientific Foundation, uh, certainly uh, enrolling and in, in following Dr. Hutchins online course, which uh, I'm hopeful that we can get access to and uh, from, from different institutions, that is, but, but a core foundation. And then recognize that uh, much, much of the, the student's education will happen after graduating. I mean, there, there's just a, mm. one, one thing that was quite profound, and, and uh, I, I had the opportunity to work with my, my late father for a couple of years coming out of graduate school. I had a, a bunch of letters behind my name. I had degrees. I thought that the world was just going to fall down like dominoes in front of me. Come, come to find out, I see Mike, Mike and Dave chuckling. Nobody gave a flying crap what <laughs> I had behind my name, right? And, and there, were, there were a couple of consultants that I had the opportunity to work with. My dad was a little bit, little bit softer in how he steered me along and, as, as his uh, firstborn. But they, we need to, we need to prove prove ourselves and 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 sort of this uh, education by fire right the, the, the producer or the, the the colleague consultants they're looking at you to provide them a practical answer they don't want to hear an academic response Mike I think back to uh, Sean Sherrod, one of our meetings uh, down in Effingham when I was there and, and you were there providing some great insights we we're doing shaker box contests perhaps kernel processing score with, with a wide audience and uh, Sean had brought me down to talk about seed genetics and I at, at that point was was fairly green in my career being a year or two out of graduate school and i gave a gave a response well if this then that or it depends on this it depends on that and sean sat me down after the meeting he said john nobody cares about your academic 
response. They want you to help them make an answer, get get to it, get to a decision. And, yeah. and that that's the type of education that happens postgraduate school. So, so Scott, coming back to your question, and then I, I look forward to to Mike and Dave's thoughts. Just a, a solid foundation, which with then we can build upon. Yeah, I again I follow with what John is saying and and Scott definitely have to have that human human touch on inter interpreting again all the information. Uh, back 40, 40, 50 years ago, we had to have that human touch and we have to have it now. They just have so much more to in their database that they can they can use and make a little bit more sophisticated decisions maybe, but have to have the human knowledge has to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think Scott. Also, we 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 know that uh, dairy comp gives these farmers just a a ton of data. Assuming, of course, they're putting it in correctly, but certainly someone is going to have to make the call on which of these charts and which of this data is going to be most effective on a given farm. Uh, here at the University of Illinois, we now have a master's degree that is a joint between animal sciences and computer sciences. Okay. So again, uh, more training in the application of uh, computer technology, computer applications, computer programs, those kinds of things. Just about every study at the University of Illinois now has uh, gene regulation. Wow, that's an area that is uh, pretty foreign to this whole guy at this point, uh, because we've had a number of studies in which the downloaded genetic uh, genome or, or, or it would indicate that the cow should have went left and the cow went right, or the, or the study went the, the opposite direction. And so the question was, well, uh, how, how do we know this genomics is really working or should say genomics, but gene regulation? And of course, the answer is, <laughs> John, we just have to do more research. Uh, yeah. Tell that to a dairy farmer when he asks that question at, at, right. at this point. And, and I, I, think, I, I think the other thing is, last comment, and that is that uh, the answers got to be pretty specific. I don't think a farmer says, well, you should feed a little bit more of the urea. And the answer is, well, how many grams is it? Uh, or I think, uh, you know, the, the feed efficiency should should go up a little bit. Well, up to what? 1.62, 1 1.65. Where, where where should that number be? There's a risk you're going to be wrong, John. I'm not sure. I'm sure you face that in Dave as well, that you make a recommendation and you say, well, that's my best estimate. And we can couch that by saying that's our best estimate here today. But uh, if you don't give them a benchmark, a value, and I'm, I'm afraid machine learning will give you a parameter like, uh, pay more attention to uh, body temperature. Well, the question is, well, what yes, body temperature? So, Mike, with with all these things we're talking about, and you mentioned earlier your family farm was 10,000 pounds. When I started in this industry, we talked, for example, crude protein. And then a few years later, we go to met, uh, metabolizable protein. And now we're bouncing for amino acids. So from 10,000 to easily 30,000 pound cows now, but how, and we've seen that those cows out of Wisconsin, those record breaking cows, but how far do you think we can go in the future? Because I never would have thought we'd got these record breaking cows 20, 30 years ago, what they're doing now at 200 pounds a day on average. Yep. Yeah. Well, certainly when you see these record cows that are producing 70,000 pounds of milk plus with very good components, because remember, that's how right. we're paid here in the Midwest. We got to have the components that go with that. So I guess, Jeff, my answer is uh, I, until we get a new record cow that gets us up to 75,000 pounds of milk, we just saw some uh, Holstein cow in the paper that made 320,000 pounds of milk, uh, a lifetime Holstein cow. Uh, and not only that, but she was excellent, David. She was a, she was a 94, 95 score yeah. cow. So besides uh, producing lots of milk, she was functionally a very functional cow as well. But I, that's a good question, and I think it goes back to John's comment that we're not really totally sure exactly what microbiome we need to have in the rumen to get that cow to do it, because we, we, we know that rumen is changing. And there was a study done, a very small study, I think came out of the, the forage center there. They, they took the rumen contents of cows and switched it. And lo and behold, they were vastly different. And about, it was a week or 10 days later, guess what? those cows went right back to where they were before, even though they had changed all the rumen contents, something was, was impacting 
uh, the, the Ruman environment. So I think this Ruman, John and David, uh, just a, just an amazing mystery in terms of exactly what is actually driving that. And of course, Bullcamp, you've got products that you're going to be putting in there to try to manipulate, to improve uh, not only the rumen, but also what about the liver? What about the mammary gland? What about the kidney? All these other organs that uh, have to uh, work together to uh, allow this cow to what what she's doing here today. Yeah, it's interesting you uh, <clears throat> refer to the rumen as a mystery. I mean, we've had uh, scientists studying it for years, and yet it's still a mystery, and uh, it, it's amazing. I, I actually think we need more microbiologists out there. I think we we don't have enough of them today. So, yeah. Keeps us all and, employed, though. Yeah, and sad, Scott, the sad thing is we had a powerful group here with Marv Bryant and Bob Hespel and that. And now they're all gone and they're replaced with people that are working in manure management, uh, those kinds of areas there, because that's where the funding is. That's where they get the grants from. So, uh, you know, unless Bullcam is going to sponsor some of that research, there's a pretty good chance that uh, we're not going to be doing a lot of stuff or uh, research in some of those what I call pretty critical areas. And hats off to those Canadian dairy farmers. Uh, they, they have a group there that they have checkoff dollars, and then they have their faculty compete for those projects. And of course, uh, those projects are usually very applied. And so suddenly now Canada has got some people at Guelph in British Columbia and Alberta that are doing some fairly applied research. And let me tell you, applied research at Illinois will get you nothing. Basically, uh, it doesn't really count. It has to be a, a USDA or a federal grant of some sort. And it has to be that because, as most of our listeners know, uh, half that money is taken off by the university. Uh, that supports the, the, the college uh, to, to, and, the, and the department and the, the university. And, and so if Balkan comes in and wants to do a research study, then by and large, uh, that may help that researcher to hire a graduate student or two, but it sure doesn't help the college and therefore doesn't count for these young professors to gain uh, tenure and, and promotion. And Mike, I think we could do a whole uh, podcast on, on research funding and how it should be done and how it's being done. It's, I think it's a gap, um, but yeah, I mean, we find it, we, we need, we, we, we have a problem getting universities with enough cows sometimes and finding uh, finding places to do our research. And then and then it is compounded by the overheads uh, that we have to pay for the research. It's it's getting difficult. Yep. Scott, just as, as Hutch, Hutchins has evolved throughout his career to, to continue having an impact, that's what we have to do with our research programs, looking at collaborative opportunities with with uh, academia and allied industry. And so to, to bridge the gap between industry and academia or, or, or scientific institutions, that's how we can continue toward uh, additional applied research projects uh, going into the future. That's my vision. Yeah, and we need more basic research too. Going back to the, uh, the 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 room and stuff, it needs to be done. If it's if it's funded by uh, industry today, they're usually looking for a, a, a near term product, right? They're 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 developing something, but we need some funding, you know, some basic stuff to, to to really understand that room and among other things. Anyway. I'm getting out of my out of my lane, Mike. No, you're doing fine. But I, I guess that's the beauty that we probably have at the U.S. Forage Research Center. Uh, that is a federally funded research area. Uh, there's one up in Peoria, but they used to do agricultural stuff. David, I don't think they're doing anything in agriculture no. anymore. No. But they no. used to have some scientists up there. But uh, those are some of the locations that uh, might be able to do some of those things. But again, it depends on the type of scientists that are going to be in those positions and what those expectations are going to be. And uh, I, I smile here because uh, one of the really good ones, Mary Beth Hall, uh, talks about some of her limitations, what she cannot do, where she cannot go, and 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 because the, of the regulations of, uh, of of the institution that she works for. Yeah, so exactly. Mike, one of my one of my regrets since being at Balchem is when I was not able to go to China with you, and that's why I had to send Scott. I can't remember why I couldn't go, but the, my team there was so excited. My Hutchins is coming. My Hutchins is coming. They were so excited. But um, so you've traveled a lot of places. What are some of your favorite places you've been? Well, certainly, I, I think uh, going to New Zealand was probably one of the, the the great, really good places to go. I'm a little biased, you know. I'm not sure I speak English very well, but that's the only language I can speak. 
And, and that's a real problem in China and Japan. Uh, wonderful discussions are going on, but I don't have a clue what they're talking about. You know, and I just kind of wish have I you ever knew. Have you ever been to Northern Ireland? I have more trouble with those guys than... <laughs> no, uh, when I was in Ireland, there was something called a war going up there. So they didn't take us neighbor close to Northern Ireland as far as that yeah. goes. But then again, Jeff, if you go down to Louisiana, I have a little trouble down in Louisiana <laughs> too, <that's true. laughs> of, of understanding understanding people as far as that goes. But certainly, uh, I, I would certainly rank in New Zealand and Australia as favorites. Uh, first of all, the language. Second of all, they, they that was a pasture-based system. We got a chance to go to some research facilities and have some very frank discussions. Um, if, if you talk about a tough meeting, I was brought the first time into New Zealand by the Feed Grain Association to sell corn. Guess how well that went over in New Zealand yeah. back uh, about 30 years ago, you know, at this point, you know, I just kind of the, the devil himself, you know. But anyway, I enjoyed those countries there. Uh, Japan is a fascinating country, but yes, much is. like Wisconsin, you go up into Hokkaido and you, you think you, you're in Wisconsin again, as far as that goes as well. We did give a chance to go to Saudi Arabia uh, on actually a consulting thing. I, I, amazing, 7,000 cows in the desert, in the desert, in the desert, 140 degrees. And these cows are averaging 40 liters of milk. And of course, the prince wanted even more. And I, I had a great suggestion for him, even though the herdsman said I will be in trouble. I said, why are you not freshening these cows in the winter in there? And he said, because we make more money selling milk in the summer and we will sell clobbered milk in the summer. And that's the end of that discussion. So we kind of, kind of moved on. But uh, th those are some of the, the favorite ones. Uh, the, 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 the fun stops in China, uh, Scott would know that as well. We got to go on some, some farms as far as that goes. Needless to say, I tend to be taller and wider than most Chinese uh, uh, consultants. And of course, showering in and showering out of a farm is eye-opening <laughs> as far as that goes. And, uh, but uh, again, um, it's amazing to see the Chinese people. I use the word carefully, Scott and Jeff, struggling because they don't have that middle management. I mean, uh, they, 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 they've got their, their PhDs up here yeah. and then they got their laborers down here and the, the guy, the gals who are really gonna run the farm, they, have to be trained. They haven't got the experience. They haven't grown up on dairy farms at that caliber, you know, and, and so uh, uh, that's that's pretty, pretty eye-opening as far as that goes. So uh, lots of countries. I think my wife counted them up about 22 different countries we've been in. Uh, we've been about uh, all, all the Canadian provinces except for Newfoundland. We've been in all of them, and uh, I, I've never had a dairy program in Rhode Island or or Montana. So I've, I've missed a couple of states. I, okay. uh, I've been in, uh, in uh, Hawaii and all in yeah. Alaska, but it wasn't for dairy functions. Was for, <laughs> for, Mike, for I'd love to play off uh, Jeff's question. And, and, and I've admired your ability to deliver messages and to carry an audience. I, I in fact, I, I studied it to some extent in conversations earlier uh, with, with a colleague. I, I've got the book made to stick here that I, I read at one point. Uh, by Chip and Dan Heath, why some ideas survive and others die. And upon reading this book, I recognize there there are a number of aspects of what they recommend that whether you studied it or developed it through experience, you are an exceptional sought after speaker. So my my question is uh, is is in this around this topic. What is your most memorable? If you could pick one or two speaking engagement over the last decade, few decades, mm. which one sticks out to you? Wow, is there another question we could answer? <laughs> uh, you, you know, I, I, I guess uh, the, the Western Dairy Conferences always impress me, the chance to, it, it's a big conference. They've got some real uh, cutting edge dairy farmers there. They are there, they are there. And so I've always enjoyed that opportunity uh, is to speak there just because of the of the the, the number and the the type of people that were there and the environment. Everybody is there for to learn something and then have a little bit of fun too. And so you'll see them in the casinos once in a while uh, losing money. That's always good for a dairy farmer. That, that's uh, they, they know all about losing money, so that, that work, works out well. I enjoyed the China experience as well. It's very formal. Uh, the the settings are 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 in hotels, very classy. All the chairs are covered as far as that goes. And then the amazing thing was that uh, we, we have a, a somewhat of a following in China. And so to get your picture taken with the speaker is a big thing. 
And, and so you have to devote about an hour a day to have your pictures taken. And of course, then if they are really aggressive, they take them over to a photo mark and then they bring them back. And then you sign the picture with that person's name, whatever, whatever his name, they write it on a piece of paper. And that's a, that's a, a treasure, I guess, or something that they, they like to have. So those are maybe two that, that come to mind, but they're, you know, that's a really fun question. And, you know, I bet you uh, we do this again at about uh, five or six o'clock night, I could even have a better answer, but those were very, very, very memorable as far as that goes. Mike, they're probably selling those pictures and uh, <laughs> making some money on them. They're I agree. A famous movie star. <laughs> I agree, Jeff. That, that's not wanting him. They're just a little cat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I just finished my uh, my bye, Joe. Do you, do you remember what you say when when they uh, they, they they toast you? They say gum by, gum by. That's right. That gum by, gum by. That means bo bottoms up. Bottoms of course, up. exactly. Yeah, that's right. And then, of course, if you're in China, if you're a good uh, a participant, then you you have to toast everybody back. And right. so suddenly, after about ten or twelve bye, Joes. Uh, the the world the world just kind of melts away. And we get pretty smart, don't we? After really smart. And, and the smartest thing we discovered was that if you put water in there, because there's always water right there, you feel as soon as you bottoms up, you fill it with water again. Yeah. Because otherwise, they come around and fill your glass up. And then yeah. we discovered quickly that we could we could buy Joe with the best of them. <laughs> yeah. Boy, I tell you, you've learned that it's, it's a it's yeah. a long it's a long or a short night, however you want to look at it. Very well. All I know, Scott, man, gang, is that you never want to speak after my touches. I mean, yeah, you always want to talk before him. And actually, Mike has always been very gracious when we were doing all the dairy days. He would be the one to say, I'll start at 10 o'clock because we know those dairymen won't be there yet. But in my mind, I'm saying, let Mike start at 10 o'clock because that will bring the dairymen there at 10 o'clock. And so, again, um, Mike, you do have that special talent that John mentioned. It's amazing. 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 You know, I, I go back to Dave Dixon, I rest his soul. When I left the University of Wisconsin, went to Minnesota, he said, Mike, now remember uh, what's important here. He said that half of what you say is important, but the other half is how you say it. And so I did a lot of stealing from people like Jim Crowley and and uh, people that would present programs. And still we go to the day, we just were at the Four State Conference and uh, Jim Drickley was speaking, just a, a classic speaker very precise, very polished. I'm going, wow, that's, that's pretty cool too. So you, you, you know, you're always kind of borrowing and you, you I watched Jeff speak. I even borrowed some things from Jeff and, and <laughs> said, you know, we would, uh, uh, you know, that, that's an interesting way to twist it. Bill Weiss, if you get a chance to listen to Bill Weiss, yeah. awesome. how he can, how he can, how he can take very complex ideas and even make them simple enough that even I can understand as far as that goes. Yeah. And I, I smile at the four day because we had four people from the committee speak. And one of the four, I had no idea what he was talking about, you know, and I'm, I'm sure everybody else did, but I sure did. But the other three, just Jim Drakely was just a classic, just yeah. classic. So, uh, uh, John, I appreciate your comments on that. Uh, a lot of that is borrowed, watching people, how they do it. And then, what, then of course, not only how they do it, but kind of watch the people. And see what they're what they're writing down. I guess that's always a another factor. That if I think if we got a good speech, then uh, most of you uh, companies will have some type of writing material there. That if they aren't writing anything down, then obviously you, you miss the mark because they there's nothing they have to remember or take back to the owner, whatever the case is. Well, Mike, I, I, I'm certainly desiring to follow in your footsteps. And you speak to borrow. I, I have borrowed and learned a tremendous amount from how you deliver messages, how you carry the audience and you, you keep it jovial yet also educational. Uh, so there, there's only a couple individuals that uh, I, I really desire to walk in their footsteps with, with you being one of them. So trust that I'm, I'm going to be borrowing and lifting. From you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, yeah. you're very, you're very kind. You're very kind. Yeah. yeah. And, and awesome. Mike, I, I would agree with that. You know, when I came to the university of Illinois, 1989, young kid out of Kentucky, really didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh, even by then, you were bigger than life. And and Jim Drakely taught me a lot. He taught me how to think critically. And I, I've never forgot that. And, you know, when I'm out there, just think critically, how to evaluate. But knowing what I know now, too, and the area I took rather than academic going into the field, I wish I'd taken the time to spend more time with you and just learn what you know. 
um, while I was at Illinois, especially. So, yeah, that's the Jeff. Uh, that's an interesting thought, you know. And and uh, we had some professors who would send their grad students with us to the four state meeting, and they'd ride in the car. Let me tell you. Four hours north and four hours south, you get to cover a lot of ground and a lot of philosophy and uh, some ideas. Uh, in fact, uh, the biggest problem I have, you don't have that problem, John, but, you know, we make farm visits. Well, we'd, 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 in some cases, we take two or three graduate students and do a farm visit. Man, that was really effective. Those farmers thought it was great. They said, oh, you got to come back next week or um, next month. And I'm going, you got to be kidding me. You know, we, it took us three hours to get there and three hours to get home and three hours on the farm uh, because the kids had to get home. They, they could, they could spring for one day, but uh, if, if there's a role, you know, in the dairy challenge, and we all know about dairy challenge that, that has really opened up that Avenue a bit because now we have a professor at most universities that will train uh, six or eight kids for the dairy challenge. And that's a skill set that's going to be so valuable. Judging, judging is okay. Critical thinking, giving reasons, that's good as well. But Boy, the, the Dairy Challenge program is probably one of the greatest things that has happened in the last 10 or 12 years here in uh, in the U.S. to give some of those kids things, Jeff, things you talked about, Jeff, that uh, they go with a professor out to a series of farms and critically evaluate and and uh, have to write it up. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Mike. I, I'm on the national board for the Dairy Challenge, and I wish that had been around when I was younger because – I mean, those kids I see come through there, they are so bright and it makes me feel intimidated, you know, by a 22 year old. So. Yeah. And it's just amazing, uh, uh, Jeffrey, that, you know, the farms they go to, at least in Illinois, they, they went to all farms at 27,000, 30,000 pound herd averages. How many things, how many things are wrong in those kind of farms? And yet those kids could diagnose and make two or three good recommendations that separated them from the, from the other teams. Uh, they, they could see through this. And uh, a lot of that had to do with economics and planning and expansion. And, and boy, I, I guess, Scott, the other thing we didn't talk much about, this dairy industry is really, really changing very, very quickly. And so uh, I'm not sure where ball cam is going to be. I mean, how do you position yourself and your staff uh, to do this? Uh, John, you're pretty insulated in the sense that you, you, you're in a very critical area. And of course, most of you know that uh, Rock River, not only do they have a great lab here in Wisconsin, but they're all over the world, they're all over the world. In fact, um, John, thank you very much. Uh, uh, a farmer in Egypt basically didn't trust his labs in Egypt and now he's going to Germany. And the Rock River lab in Germany has just done a yeoman's job for him. And uh, because I get to see your results and it's pretty amazing to see how Egyptian corn silage is not Wisconsin, Illinois, corn silage. Let me tell you that much. So <laughs> very, very interesting. Yeah. Gentlemen, this has been a great discussion, uh, but they have flickered the lights, which means it's uh, it's last call. So what I'd like to do is ask each of you to kind of give us uh, two or three things that you'd like to communicate to uh, educators today and future educators. Uh, what should they know when going into um, animal agriculture? Our last call question is sponsored by AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine, the next generation in amino acid balancing. With AminoSure XM, you can save up to $0.05 cents per cow per day on your methionine investment. Try it today and receive an additional $0.2.5 cents per cow per day savings with Belchem's limited-time rebate offer. Contact your Belchem representative to learn more. And I will start with Jeff. Well, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question specifically, but I've got a couple of comments, Scott. So right. I've never really followed your direction anyway. <laughs> um, and, and and so my first, it's actually a question to Mike, and I can't I can't remember how it was phrased because it was 25, 30 years ago. But during my defense, I was asked, "What's?" I think it was the fastest way. It might have been the most efficient way to increase total amount of milk on a farm. And I was a aspiring PhD scientist thinking I had to come up with a biological question. And I came up with some BS answer. I mean, you gave me some look because you were on my defense. And you said, you just buy more cows. 
<laughs> and I, I've never, I've, I've never forgot that. I've told that story, told that story a lot. And uh, the other thing I'll tell on you, Mike, is, um, and you said it earlier, and all of your Gary Day's talks. Anytime I've heard you, um, and you said it today earlier, I'm gonna pick on Balkim. I love the way you've always picked on somebody during your presentations, um, and 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 you do it without insulting anybody. That's what I love about it. So, but appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. Dave, any final thoughts? Well, certainly I'm a little bit disappointed that uh, Mike did not try to win a piece of pie during this hour discussion. <laughs> I have personally lost several pies or my wife had to bake several pies because Dr. Mike on the road would say, oh, fish, I'll bet you a piece of pie. And foolishly, I'd say, well, I think we will. And I lost. I did win once or twice. So anyway, but I, I, I tell you what, Scott and John and, and Jeffrey, I mean, this has been awesome to pay tribute to Dr. Mike. Um, I've always said in Illinois to all of our dairy producers and, and still do that the best thing that ever happened to Illinois was Mike Hutchins coming into the state. Um, unfortunately, it was not a good thing for Minnesota, but we were sure happy <laughs> to have Mike with us. And uh, Mike, truthfully, uh, you've been like a, like, like a brother to me, my man, and uh, your abilities, as we all talked about, John mentioned, we all try to mimic you. On the good stuff. I mean, there's some stuff you do. I don't want to mimic. <laughs> on the good stuff. On the good stuff. And so, Mike, um, my toast to you, my friend, and thank you for all you have done for Illinois, for the state, for the nation, and for the world. You the man. You the man. Yeah. Thank you. Well thank said, you. Dave. John, you want to follow that? Well, I'm glad, <laughs> glad the fly came up because if, if that wouldn't have come up, I shed a tear i was going to bring it up the right. piece of pie you know mike that that speaks to the unexpected nature to working with you collaborating with you and when you're, when you're speaking in front of an audience we just just uh we, we get into a topic and at times we've all listened to, to speakers that are boring it is never boring working with you uh collaborating with you listening to you speak uh, and in our conversations they, they've always been exciting and that that is one thing that i i just uh i, I hold so dear thinking about our, our work together uh, the, one other aspect, uh, I guess, that I, I bring to light would be the, the other person I seek to walk in, in their footsteps is my late dad. Uh, we, not, not to take us down, down that path too deeply, but I recognize uh, in losing my father a few years ago unexpectedly, we've only got a certain period of time on this planet. We're renting space on this earth. And I have been absolutely blessed to work alongside uh, Dr. Hutchins, uh, for for a few years now, and at the same time, with with excitement, Mike, you're with us. Uh, I look forward to your continued work uh, for year, hopefully years to come. And you you've done uh, tremendous work for our industry. I, I hate to hate to think that yes, Illinois has really benefited from from your work being near and dear to my heart as a as a Badger and recognizing you do have some strong Wisconsin roots, but you've you've offered uh, exceptional guidance, ex exceptional education. The fire that you bring day in, day out, as recently as a few weeks ago, is exceptional. So I, I look forward to you carrying that for years into the future, but also to reflect back uh, on your career to this point. What an absolute uh, asset you are to our industry. And I will work very hard to walk in your footsteps and, and uphold the standards, very high standards that you've set uh, for those of you that, uh, for those of us that, that seek to walk in your footsteps. So I thank you for setting that bar so high. Thank you, John. Mike, uh, any final words? Yeah, I, just, just two very short ones. I, uh, first of all, thanks to Ball Kim. This has been a, a fascinating and almost humbling, humbling experience. So I want to thank David and John for taking time uh, and Jeffrey, time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. And and I'm sure if anybody want to listen to it or not, but my two parting thoughts are number one is uh, we are in uh, the pe people business and surround yourself with a good team. And I have been very blessed at Minnesota and Illinois here to have a very good team. And the team is very broad. Ball Kim is part of the team, uh, you know, and, and that, that's, that's really gonna be important. And then the other thought very briefly is change and things change. It's amazing we had a chance when you retire, you get, a, you get to look back 35 years, 40 years, and it's just amazing 
uh, how things have changed. And I'm convinced that in the next 40 years are going to change a great deal more. And just be ready and decide if you're at Rock River Lab or if you're at Volcam, how are you going to change your company, uh, the clientele, the farmers that you're going to work with there in the future. And with that, uh, I'm just going to sign off and uh, turn it back to you, Scott. Thanks very much for everybody. Have a good one. Well, Mike, you've been a, a great, uh, yeah, cheers. <laughs> you've been a great educator. Uh, you've been a great ambassador for the industry. I, I personally appreciate the joy and the passion that you uh, bring to your job and, and to, to the people that, that you've educated. Uh, John, Dave, Jeff, want to thank you for sharing uh, the memories and insights uh, today. It's, it's uh, been a treat. And as always, want to thank our loyal listeners for coming along for 50 episodes and sticking with us. And we hope to explore uh, more uh, topics uh, with you in the future. And so we hope to hope you learned something, hope you had some fun. And we hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash realscience to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.